Thanks for joining me for another Wrestling Observer podcast, episode number 764. Thanks for being here. Catching the show as you always do. The website is wrestlingisreal.com. By the way, I changed all the websites on my network. The KOP, King of Podcasts Radio Network Podcasts. I always kind of miss on the S. But anyways, kingofpodcasts.com is now a new site. And all the shows are available there. Plus all the music programming that I listen to, like my Spotify music playlists, are all right there. Four of them, pretty expansive. I hope you'll check them out all yourselves. If you have a Spotify account, please do. Would love for you to do that. Of course, you can find the show, Apple, Amazon, Spotify, iHeartRadio, wherever you find your podcasts. And the website is wrestlingisreal.com, where you can find the show in audio video form. And links to the social media and all my other stuff. So there's quite a few things to bring up where backlash is starting to work itself up right now. Well, now we're to the point where we had got a couple of significant matches already set up. We know that Bad Bunny and Rey Mysterio will probably team up somewhere down the line, and that'll be set up with a judgment day somewhere. We'll get that. And then. We already have Cody and Brock set up. And the six-man tag match has already been set up with the Usos and Solo Sokoa against Kevin Owens, Sami Zayn, and Matt Riddle. So, good. All good matches all set up. Then i got to bring up the Cavender Twins because now the announcement's been made that they're already finishing their basketball career. They're going to go directly into the Performance Center and start working in the Next Alive program with WWE. We're still waiting for somebody to come out of that program to do something here because that was what was set up for Gable Stevenson, the guy from Michigan to see where he was going to go. Like we're still waiting for one of these next in line stars to really pan out. Because with NXT, I've lost all interest in that product. I don't want to watch Grayson Waller and Carmelo Hayes and Braun Breaker. They're such one dimensional characters. Like, honestly, I don't get much out of it. Like, I watched Stayed in the Liver. I mean, I watched it, but man, I am not into that show anymore. It's like, it's not, it's not a point of viewing for me anymore. I just don't, it's like, it's like, like how I don't watch Rampage. I guess there, I don't have anything necessarily else to watch when I'm watching on, on TV. So like, I have that there, but like, I'm not really much into it doesn't really matter to me much. So I'm trying to get myself into other programming that I have to watch. NBA Playoffs is on right now, things like that. And of course, I go to the movies. That's why I don't necessarily watch around for Rampage, because I'll catch SmackDown before I go to the movies. So it's like, there's just some wrestling that hasn't been there for me. And honestly, I've kind of lost all track of MLW, because when they put on that Reels channel, it's only available on cable. And I'm like, honestly, I'm not good at watching shows on cable at all. Not anymore. I will not go back to the box and watch my DVR. Like, you know what? I had like 11 episodes and I tried to get to one of them and I watched, but I'm like, I'm not watching the show this way. Like I've gotten spoiled to watching everything on streaming. Reels is not something for streaming. And now finally MLW put their stuff back on YouTube. And even then to be way, I'm not watched much because I also feel like they haven't gone in a certain direction either. Again, the way is kind of like just mulling along, but there's nothing spectacular to be right there anyway either you know and I think one of the things that the fans out there were after Wrestlemania and basically everything else has gone on since everyone wants to go ahead and pile on and say this is all Vince's fault Vince is the great scapegoat but I see the programming right now leading up the backlash is fine because we're still getting on Raw and SmackDown matches that were scheduled to book. We're getting three or four things that are scheduled to be featured on the show. And they're doing just fine. Like, But I'm not going to go out here every week either and start saying, well, look, we're just going to go ahead and look at every show and just let me look with, with what everything that they did this week. Did they do, you know, do I need to debunk the fact that everybody thinks that all this stuff that's going on with each show, are they kind of screwing it up? So I'm going to tell you they're not. Look, I'll do it again. I'll do it one more time for you. SmackDown, April 14th. If we run down with the show's done, tell me where there's the whole Vince screwing up thing. Look, they give you Shinsuke Nakamura coming back as a heel, right? 
They already had announced also that Liv Morgan and Raquel Rodriguez were going to be in a championship celebration. Santos Escobar and Damian Priest fought. They did that. And Xavier was LA Knight. They fought. They did that. Usos are coming for the tag team titles. And Owens and Zayn sound like they're already cracking under pressure for having those titles after just two weeks. That's what Jimmy said to them. So those four at each other, Zayn, Owens, and the Usos, and Matt Riddle coming from behind after Sokoa was attacking Zayn and Owens, right? Three on two, and then Matt Riddle evens it out. Then they show where social media was set up where Xavier Woods and LA Knight would fight in a match. Xavier Woods won. Empyrean is discussing strategy. And Woods now wants to go after the Intercontinental title. And they're setting things up where Gunther and Xavier Woods next week are fighting for the IC title. There you go. So they set that up. One week set up to get to that. That's fine. And then you get Zane and Riddle backstage, okay? Damian Priest talking to Rey Mysterio, saying that Rey Mysterio and the LWO shouldn't have gotten involved with their business. So, you know, we're going to get Judgment Day dealing with Bad Bunny and Rey Mysterio down the line. They just haven't said what the match is yet. And Damian Priest went over Santos Escobar. Like, they're not doing anything here that's, like, out of the mix. Like, the LWO stuff is very prominent. Judgment Day... See Xavier Woods and LA Knight. These are like are these matches with the with the people that Vince would want? You think these are matches he would set up? Like, really? Do you think we're getting any of that? Gunther, do you think he'll still be that IC champion as it was? Well, you I mean there I just think are there certain people that are out there that you think would still be prominent on Raw or SmackDown if Triple H wasn't in charge? Because he is. That's why I want to make the point. Then Raquel and Liv get attacked by Sonya and Chelsea, right? We go through that. And Nakamura, he has his match with Mad Cat Moss. And Nakamura comes in and looks strong coming back. And then Scarlet throws a card down, Nakamura's face is on it, and Kara crosses TikTok. So they're setting that up. Do you think Shinsuke Nakamura and Karrion Cross in a featured feud would be something that Vince would allow? No. No, absolutely not. You could do with the bloodline. You work off of that. Riddle and Sokoa. And Sokoa wins. Smart. And then we move along and go into Raw. And then you start off with the deal. A short-term agreement with everything going on with the Judgment Day now going along with the bloodline to take care of the Usos, right? Or sort of take care of uh, Zayn and Owens. So you got that set up. That's fine. And then in the matches themselves, what? You already had four things were scheduled. Seth Rollins and The Miz. Austin 3, Bobby Lashley for the U.S. title, or it was a non-title, I guess. Trish explaining what she did to going heel on Becky Lynch and Lita. And Brock returning. We got all that. But everyone wants to say it's Vince. Vince, 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 Vince. No, it's not. No, it's not. Stop. Stop, 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 stop it. Okay. They set things up where the Judgment Day could also have an issue with the bloodline down the line because this very fractured and somewhat volatile situation is coming up. And this could also go bad. Right? So... We get into this, and Heyman doesn't like the Finn Balor's not happy about this, but he's going to put sit differences aside because he's going to put up this short-term deal, right? And Roman Reigns was the one that set it up. So Judgment Day has a bad buddy concern. Solo is an expert at assuaging, assuaging concerns. Wow, that's that's a hard word, Paul. And then Solo and Ripley are looking at each other, staring each other down. And Rian and Solo have their issues, right? And the Judgment Day has needs to have something to be taken care of for Bad Bunny, and Solo's going to take care of that before their concerns become a problem. And then Owens, Zayn, and Riddle is going up against the Judgment Day later in the night, and Solo goes up against Rey Mysterio. 
So those matches, set up with the Bloodline storyline, set up with everything else with the tag titles, the Judgment Day is now intertwined into the storyline. That's good storytelling. Because then the Judgment Day is going to be caught up in all this after the fact. Like, everybody getting a rub off the Bloodline storyline works. Sami Zayn, Kevin Owens, Sol Sokoa. Now you're adding the Judgment Day, which, without having to deal with Edge, now you have this. So now you have this setup where the Bloodline and the Judgment Day is getting a relevant storyline. They're just being brought in as, as a sub arc into this storyline, a subplot. It's smart. It's all logical and smart. And there's animosity, which is even better, which has been there. This is all logical. You're telling me that Vince is involved in this? You're telling me that Vince is having his hand on this? You think he's doing something with this? No. No, he's not. Stop it. So Solo wins over Ray. Then Bianca Belair takes on Dakota Kai in quick fashion. Brosser Reed is still going to be dealing with Bobby Lashley going up down the line. Like, am I really much into that storyline? No, but Bronson is a Triple H guy. We brought him back. Here we are. And Bobby is the veteran now working with the younger guy trying to get Bronson over. Good. The Judgment Day, we're talking about Paul Heyman. Heyman and Ripley look at each other uncomfortably. And Heyman's still trying to be the conduit, trying to be the mediator, the peacemaker here. There's still the animosity, and then Paul has to call Roman Reigns because he has to get this all squared away. Cody calls out Brock Lesnar. That's good. And then Adam Pearce says, well, no, don't fight tonight. But then Brock Lesnar comes out. They get a pull apart, and Cody and Brock are set for backlash. So they set that up. It's fine there. Cody attacks at security cards. Everything's fine there. And by the way, I keep reading things about the match with Cody and Roman at WrestleMania, Stone Cold Steve Austin says, Cody losing was the right decision. MJF talks about that, and he says that was also the right decision. You know, Cody was a top guy. He went out there like a top guy. He wrestled like a top guy. He had a match like a top guy. Like, everybody wants to go ahead and say that Cody should have won. Well, that's all of you that want to go ahead and have your cake and eat it too. Like, you don't want to have suspense. You don't want to have the eventual turn around like you're going to get that story okay look look at what they did with the payoff of Sami Zayn and Kevin Owens they got back together and they won the tag team titles everything that you wanted right they gave you that and WrestleMania they gave you that match they gave you that that excitement they gave you that wonderful moment so the fact that Cody didn't get it either that's fine Cody should not be getting Roman Reigns in that victory right away that's got to take a while and to put obstacles in his way and maybe wait till next year's WrestleMania where Roman Reigns is unstoppable and somehow continues to find a way to keep holding on. But there's animosity with the Judgment Day and the Bloodline and the Bloodline themselves are fractured as well because Solo is, is well favored, but the Usos are not because the Usos couldn't get the job done. That's why the Judgment Day got involved. Like this is all really good stuff here. Just who's going to turn? Because Judgment Day and Bloodline are going to be set to face off against each other. And you do understand that. But then eventually we're going to have, you're going to have the Usos and Solo eventually have to go and take on. And then Rhea probably evolve and maybe at some point. Maybe maybe not she's not in that match because as long as she's smacked the Women's Champion, she won't. But that's a three on three right there. And Roman's not involved in that unless Cody gets involved in it. The main event storyline has so many different people in it. That's excellent. Look at what we have in the main event storyline of the Bloodline. Okay, you have all these people, right? Uso, Solo, Roman, Sami Zayn, Kevin Owens, Matt Riddle, Cody Rhodes, Judgment Day. That's a lot of that main upper echelon that is now intertwined in this main event storyline, and they're all benefiting from it. And as we've already seen, a couple of these stars have really made really steps on it, right? Cody. Brock Lesnar kind of involved in it now, but in a different way. 
Judgment Day continues to be in a prominent role as their faction. Like this is all stuff that is being done right. This is the writing. And by the way, it doesn't really matter if it's like Vince or anybody else, because right now the storytelling is still solid. Is it exciting every minute? No, but that's what a soap opera is. It can be passive and then it can be active. But they can add wrinkles like this to continue to further the storyline and they can just continue to tell a story. So they can let this bloodline thing go on for years. Like what they're doing right now is like what we, what I would have seen in on Dallas back in the day, right? If you didn't know the show, you can go look for it. Dallas is a great show. Try it if you want to. I got to season nine and then I had to stop. A lot of things just happened. So I never got the gun finished off. But what I will say is it's like that. It's like Yellowstone. That's a good example, which by the way, is ending, ending after season five, by the way. I just learned that. Now, with that said, I don't give a shit if Vince is involved or not, because I don't think he is. If you want to go and have that whole thought process, oh, Endeavor and Vince, no, 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 no. Like, okay, listen, the main product right now is still rocking and rolling. SummerSlam, you're sold 30,000 tickets initially. They're going to sell out Ford Field in Detroit in August. They're going to sell it out. They're going to do well with another card of the uh, Clash of the Castle. Money in the Bank, that's probably going to do sell out pretty well when they get to that. They're not hurting, man. And those crowds are hot. Little Rock, Arkansas last night, hot. Or oh, Monday night, excuse me. Hot. They're doing really well. And the ratings, oh, oh, the ratings, oh, guess what? 1.8 million. It was 1.18, 1818 million last week. 1.818. This week, 1.815. And it had the NBA playoffs going on at the same time. And you know what? The demo for the 18-49, to 49, that's good. Against the NBA playoffs, it's not bad. That's not bad. Look, let me tell you. Let me just put this point across to you now. If I go look at Chill Buzz Daily as we speak, right? And I look at what their ratings look like for cable. On Monday, going up against, it's like this. The NBA playoffs still had a prominent audience. They had at seven thirty, the first round game had three million viewers, and four point three million viewers for the second game. And I believe it was the what was it? Yeah, you had who was on Monday? It was Lakers and yeah, Lakers and Grizzlies, and I think it was not the Bucks and the Heat. Or maybe it was the Bucks and the Heat. But like, look, NBA playoffs standing out. That was their competition. And the fact that WWE was able to stay on top. 8 o'clock, 1.945 million. 1.9 million for hour two. Hour three, 1.5. That third hour is always going to be rough. We know that. They at least are trying, man. They're trying. But the ratings did really hold up for two hours. So 8 to 10, if they could just have that audience 8 to 10, I think they would be just fine. But they're not doing bad on that. I mean, compared to what they're going to have, if the audience is actually staying around, like the real test is going to be Monday Night Football. They can hold that 1.8 to near 2 million, that will be pretty good. But what they have right now, they're showing the LA breakdown here is 1.75, 1.96 for hour two. No, I'm sorry, it is. So last week, the ratings went up an hour one, slightly down an hour two, but not by much. And hour three uh, took it, uh, actually went up. Oh no, sorry, it went down. It went, did it go down? Sorry. But like, still, man, for what it's worth, if you look at the, the ratings they've had since. WrestleMania. It was 2.1 million for the WrestleMania 38 Fallout. 1.8, then 1.6, 1.6. Well, actually, last year, excuse me, that was last year. So if you want to look at what that was last year under Vince, 2.1, then 1.8, then 1.6, 1.6, 1.5, and ratings just went down after that. 
And if you even look at what happened ever since SummerSlam, since they came back after that, the ratings have gone up. Remember, SummerSlam Fallout, 2.2 million. And then they stayed between 1.9 and 2 million. 2.1 for the go home show for Clash of the Castle. And the Monday Night Football came in and they just chopped the knees out from underneath Raw because it would never get higher than 1.6 or 1.7 million viewers for the rest of the year. But still, ratings were consistent as best as they could do. And once football went away, no more football playoffs. 30th anniversary, 2.3, 2.1, 1.8. You got the 2 million for the fallout of Elimination Chamber. 1.7, 1.8 across all through February and March. And then since WrestleMania fallout, 2.2 million then, 1.8, 1.8. So there's a good chance now that the company is actually doing some things where they're getting some programming out there that people are actually really enjoying and liking, and that's great. That's good news for them. And then as for Raw, after that, what, Seth and The Miz, they had their match. Seth wins. Then you have Bronson Reed that is interfering with Theory and Lashley. And Sonya and Chelsea beat Candice Real and Michin. Like, I didn't think Candice Real would be coming. Candice Real would be coming back, but there you go. As a Triple H person, so is Michin. And Sonya Deville, Chelsea Green win, and they're going to go ahead and take on Liv and Raquel. So that all works out. And then Usos or Bloodline against oh, the, the, and we had Trish Stratus. Pretty good job on the heel turn. And her explaining what she did, she worked with a partially torn hamstring from what we learned as well. Hey, she did a good job. And Trish Stratus coming back to take on Becky Lynch to really put over that. Like that match between the Women's Revolution against the original Women's Revolution. Yeah, I love that story. And that Trisha's coming back. She looks great. It, you almost feel like she didn't even leave. She looks amazing. She is aged gracefully and still looks amazing. She still looks hot. So happy about that. And Trish and Becky will have a good, whatever they decide they're going to do, they'll have a good feud together. I think I'll like that. It'll be good all over off. Let's move along now, and let's talk about the Cavender Twins. Because we need to go ahead and pay attention to the fact that without the Bell Twins being around, if the Cavender, tw the Cavender Twins can do what the Bell Twins did for the company, there's a lot there. There are two young, beautiful, blonde girls that are athletic, they're very talented, and they've decided to go ahead and leave basketball. Their agent, Jeff Hoffman, confirmed the Twins are set to begin training at the Performance Center this spring. And like I said, there's a lot to be said about these girls when they make their way in. But at the moment right now, if you look at their profile, they got a big, huge, uh, yeah, they got a pretty good following out there. At the moment, 217,000 followers on Instagram, but their real deal is TikTok. Like if you really want to find out what they're all about, that is where everything comes down to. Because their popularity is on TikTok. Because the TikTok feed, they have 4.5 million followers. And by the way, they're not even the WWE yet. But they've become pretty popular so far. And so with them, we look at what they're doing so far, and they got interviewed on the Today Show. We love the WWE, their fan base, the sport, the fitness side of it, and it fits their brand and aligns great with us. And while there's the, the questioning of the ability to, to be able to perform in the ring, they're, they're not, not, they're not, no doubt they're good athletes. But their future, they say, who cares if they're not the best wrestlers, they say. Because they talk about Hulk Hogan being an average wrestler at best, but he had legions of fans who loved him anyway. Well, by the way, with Hulk Hogan, if you watch his matches in Japan, he wasn't that bad. He was not that bad. So right now the twins are camera ready. Camera loves them. Okay? Extremely fit and healthy. 
and they will undergo rigorous training to ensure their safety and to perfect their movements. And the Cavender Twins are just coming off of a high because they helped guide the Miami Hurricanes women's basketball team to the Elite Eight of the NCAA Women's Basketball Tournament. And they're going to give us just another feel of what will happen again with everything going on with the Cavender Twins. But like, let me tell you like this too. Jake Paul, who's, you know, Logan Paul's brother, got him into a deal to get him in a marketing deal. Because right now, they just signed with Jake Paul and his company Better to accelerate the growth of their brand. And Better is looking to go ahead, bring him on as business partners, and headline faces for the female audience of the company, which is focused on gambling and media. By the way, they also have their own Twin Talk podcast, which will now also be appearing on Better. And they talk about working with Jake Paul. They said that Better gives us the ability to accelerate the growth of the Cavender Twins brand in a focused and truly authentic manner. That's fine. And if Jake Paul wants to put these girls out there and, and get more of an exposure, yeah, they're selling a little bit out, but that's fine. Let them do it if it works out for them. These are the kind of things that need to happen where I still did this idea back a few years ago when they put the next in line program in place. They shouldn't have abandoned it. But I think there's something with this that that it still is going to be, I still feel like it's going to pay off some way, somehow. Now, the last time we talked about it, we did hear about the name image likeness program in WWE. And in January of this year, they added 50 more athletes into the program. And so you had people that were in soccer, tennis, track and field, football players. They got a couple of big football players, okay? They got Cameron Jones, who's a Cincinnati player, six foot eight, 320. That's big. And then you look at football, another Penn State player, Nick Dawkins, 6'4", 315. And then you got a lot of, there's quite a few women in this list that are either track and field, that are soccer or tennis. Like, there's a lot there. And so far, the next in line program in WWE has already signed 46 college athletes since the inception, December 2021. And they still got Gable Stevenson, who's not there yet. And they signed 13 different sports including 35 members of Power 5 conferences who have collectively earned 40 NCAA All-American Honors and 12 NCAA National Championships. Yeah. And I hope there's something that comes up where they're going to really get something big. Like, they can do something right now. And by the way, when it comes to the followers that the WWE has right now on their, all their platforms, their TikTok has 20... 0.9 million followers. Instagram, 27 million followers. And by the way, the TikTok for WWE has gotten so good. I don't even talk about that, but really, the clips they put on there, they're so well done. Plus, you know how in Raw and SmackDown, you hear more of the end ring goings on and you start seeing more of the camera shots on things that's being done. And it's just so good. It's just so good. They're not corny or cheesy. Like, you're just done well. Even like the marketing that they have right now for Puerto Rico, solid. We're, what, two weeks away from Puerto Rico? All those shows are sold out, I think, right? They're set up to go to Puerto Rico, new market for them for a, after a long time away. And now they can be here. And Bad Bunny is one of the best ambassadors to have out there right now. No doubt about it. Everything's working out for them. It's just a good mix. All right. Right now, I need to apologize. For those of you who listen to this program for any length of time, you know I absolutely always follow Impact Wrestling. And I did not get a chance to finish and take care of Rebellion. But for what it's worth, I did get a chance to watch most of the show, I did not get to catch all the women's main event. That was the only thing I did not get a chance to catch. But 
Nevertheless, I did catch the ending of the women's main event, so I know that Deanna Parasso won. And good fashion with the Queen's Gambit to go and finish up the match. Overall, the show wasn't bad. Plagued by injuries, which that's really rough. And Impact Wrestling, I guess it's kind of the reason where they don't necessarily go too intertwined into storylines. They don't like to do that too much. And, you know, they want to go ahead and they have their storylines. There's not too much they want to dig into the weeds with because of the fact there's only so much resources they have when they go out to a do a show and all these tapings are being done. So to make sure that the continuity stays pretty intact, they're writing the shows before they get to taping them the night after the pay-per-view. And if they're going to add anything else, it's not going to be too much that will really conflict or really collude with what they're planning to go and do on the TV show. Their storylines have been there, but I haven't been necessarily overly impressed by them either. You know, Scott Demore and the team there, they just have a certain way of how they want to write shows. It's more about in-ring than anything else, but they have good in-ring action anyway, so, you know, it's fine. But they have a formula, and they stick to that formula. They're not really going much off of that anyway. The difference is, is that we know that Josh had to go and relinquish, and so did Mickey James relinquish the knockouts title. So the last rodeo is not over. But she had to just let it go because she had an injury. Charles, Josh Alexander had an injury. So those two matches were guaranteed new world champions. They did it. In terms of what they did for the show. So Impact World Tag Team Titles. Austin and Bay winning over the Motor City Machine Guns and Ultimate X. I don't like seeing a match like an Ultimate X like this when it's... I mean, sure, there's four players in the match, but doesn't do much for me. Like, I know they've done a match like this before with the, the Ultimate X as a tag team title match. I much prefer to have a four or five or six way for the... You want to put, you know, for the X Division? It should be an X Division match, so I'm a bit of a purist on that part. I would have preferred it. Like, I mean, they're all X Division stars, yes. But, you know, it is... Uh, that match should kind of stick to that. I don't know what they could have done with that, but they wanted to put a stipulation, so they decided, we haven't done that old backs in a while, let's do that. Fine. I don't have a problem with that. Then you get the four-on-three, which, I mean, if didn't, anybody didn't get to see why there was a four-on-three, that eventually was going to be a three-on-three. Three. Well, Callahan, out of this whole time, was betraying the design, and he's out. But I need to understand in the storyline why Callahan even joined them in the first place. Like, I get what they did, but, like, I wasn't really much buying it. I don't think anybody else was going to buy it. They were going to stay in the design. The guy's too much of a bigger name than anyway. Him for to be out there, right? I mean, he's had his, he's had his own faction. And, like, what are we going to do here? I wish they, see, and I think that's the other thing, too, for me is, you know, Callahan and Moose have been champions, but they have to be intertwined into other things that I'm not necessarily happy about either. They're just kind of in there, and that's it. And Eddie Edwards also kind of in the same way. They're just in the mix, but they're not necessarily doing anything very important. Eddie Edwards was part of the Honor the More faction, sure, and they're still kind of stretching that out, which is fine. I get it. But that... I don't know, more storylines should be finished by now. The design and stretching them out after Eric Young goes away, I haven't necessarily really bought into. Like, it's a group. Beater, Angels, and Khan, yeah. But I'm not much been into that storyline either. And that's what's been the weakness of the, of the brand right now, is that everything just feels kind of flat. So, Santino Morella looked good in action in this match. Show Henry, you know, seeing about here in this pay-per-view for this match tonight. By the way, the group at the Rebel, when they go back to that venue, it's been, what, three years? And the last time they were there was a Rebellion, which was a very good Rebellion, I remember. That venue is really cool. For what Impact Wrestling does, it's a very cool venue. It's nice to get to do tapings from there. It's a good dynamic compared to the normal setup they have with all the dark around it. That that roof and the way they have it set up, it's a pretty cool spot. And that crowd in Toronto is very loud and wild, which is nice. But anyway, 
they did the swerve where Callahan was going to go ahead and hit Santino Morel with the bat, but he swerved. Santino has the Cobra to win the match. Everybody's all happy with that. PCO and Eddie Edwards last rights match. Jesus, man. PCO. This guy still amazes me what he's able to do. And I think this guy actually was Ring of Honor champion before the end of the Sinclair era. Or what, maybe that wasn't the last year. That was Jonathan Grisham. But still, PCO actually being champion at one point in this company. And that company seems was really amazing. Because he's just, what a what a good asset to have out there. He's just good. And Eddie Edwards played really good in this. You know, a real extra heel. And Alicia's out there. But they made it a, not a very long match. And PCO is not human. Doesn't feel pains from the shovels to the stuff being done around the casket to all the moves he does outside the ring. Crazy. So he hits Eddie with a shovel, choke slams him in the casket. I like the PCO win. And I like the Honor No More is completely squashed, as it should have been. But, I mean, it's not the impact people that took out Honor No More so much. I, mean, I guess they did. But really it was PCO that really kind of just broke the whole group up. Elimination three-way, Trey Miguel, Speedball Mike Bailey. And, by the way, Trey Miguel and Mike Bailey to finish up. Great. And while Bailey almost had a chance to win, it was Trey that still gets a way to get the win. And Mike Trey McGill, eh. There's not many people they have over there. They're kind of light on the X Division too. Really? They're kind of light on the roster in general. But, I mean, it's definitely watchable. It's definitely good. But, like NWA, I'd like to see a little bit of change, a little bit of freshness in the storylines, a little bit of freshness in what they're doing with the stars. Because I think it's a bit stale. I really do. They've given a lot of time to Tommy Dreamer and Bully Ray and their feud, coming in from everything else. And then they had the Hardcore War, which was cool. The ECW style match. And they did have the women come in there with Killer Kelly and Masha Slamovich, which was nice. Other than that, you know, they put the match together and Dreamer comes crashing down for a flying splash off the ladder through the table to get the pin. That's cool. But now the big story of the whole night, besides the fact that Macklin becomes world champion, they've been building him up pretty well. Kashida was just kind of in the mix. And I think if Josh Alexander would have been in that three-way match, maybe the plan was for Steve Macklin to become champion. Because I believe that was what they were going to go with. Steve Backlund's champion, I'm fine with. I don't have a problem there. So it's interesting. He wins the belt. And at the same time, his girl, Deanna Parazzo, the virtuosa, beats Jordan Grace. And Jordan Grace getting a little bit of controversy because she had just come back from, you know, competing in uh a weightlifting competition. You know, one of those uh, bodybuilding competitions. And so people are like, like, what's going on with her? Listen, Jordan Grace has done a good job to put herself in the shape that she's in now. As I've said for the last year plus, she's in impeccable shape. And part of it is that she really got herself, I mean, she got the high of doing the bodybuilding stuff and she really got into it. And now she's in a level of fitness that's like incredible. But the thing that really stood out to me in the entire night, the real newsworthy storyline is Nick Aldis. He comes out of the guest commentate for the world title fight, the Impact World Title Fight, and the National Treasure now, Impact Wrestling, returning back, by the way. And he talked to Fightful.com about it. And so he says that November 2022 he would leave the company. And we haven't seen him since. And then, oh, excuse me, he talked to PW Mania, PW Mania's Legends, let's rethink this. And now he's back to the company. And his return to impact, and he has gratitude for the opportunity. Well, look, the reason is that Jeff Jarrett always had something behind, always felt good about Magnus or Nick Aldis. He always felt good about that guy. Put him as a champion at Rinka King when they put that project out in India. Had him as world champion when they were running there. Well, not when, when Hogan and Bischoff were in charge, but you know what? During the impact era... The direction with the TNA era, Magnus was champion. 
that was a very early start for him. He might have gotten the belt earlier than expected. But there was something about him that was really special. And now he comes back. He is a star. And let me just tell you, Nick, all this, he wants to stick to, you know, the other brands and not be a WWE guy. It's like a sting. Something about that. I think, I'm pretty sure, I really believe in my heart of hearts, I think Triple H was trying to approach him. I think Nick Aldis would have been a nice move going into WWE if they were going to try to get him. But I didn't want to see him there. And honestly, I like that he's coming in in this NWA persona that he built himself over the last, what, seven years or so? Building the NWA back up to where it was. And now he's over here. Because he did benefit when he was working in NWA. Billy Corgan benefited from Nick Aldis. I don't know what the falling out came up, but it's unfortunate for that. So Impact and I, opportunity presented itself, he said. We're all very much on the same page. We were all excited about it. We shook hands, made an agreement, and I was set to start the rebellion. If Scott Demore is not there as president of Impact Wrestling and running the show, I don't see Nick Aldis making his way back. But at this moment, Scott Demore runs the show, and Scott Demore is doing fine. Listen, limited roster, limited resources, limited budget. They got a good roster in there. My only thing, my only gripe is the freshness of the, a little bit of stale roster. NWA has a pretty good group out there. Not necessarily happy about Tyrus being champion, but like, you know, there's a group out there that's pretty good. For what it's hurt, it just, there's a lot there. So he finds his way in. He says he's tremendously grateful to Impact for showing the level of respect that he had with him. So now the responsibility is for mine to prove them right. And so he gets his first in-person experience with Steve Macklin. Very cool to sort of get there for his big opportunity, his level up moment, because I remember when it was like to get the shot at the world title himself. And that's going to be part of the storyline he must tell. His first run as TNA world champion. And Macklin is in the same role now. At all this, I hope he gets some good, good time out there, some promo time to explain everything and to set things up with Steve Mack, because that actually is a feud I really enjoy. I'm going to enjoy that. And then with Josh Alexander, whenever he can make his way back, I mean, Nick Aldis, there's a lot of feuds to put in with him right now. But him with Steve Macklin is a great start. So he says, at the very key point in your career, it's time to get serious. You realize you got opportunity here to establish yourself for a long time to come, but it's now on you to deliver the goods at that main event level. So I'm happy to see Nick Aldis come make his way back. It's wonderful. And as for the matches that we saw at Rebellion, I'm happy with De- Deanna Prossum and Steve Backlund being champions. Like, there's not anything right now to where, I mean, it sucks that Mickey James loses the belt and Josh Alexander loses the belt. So now you're, you've got two mainstays on the roster that are here to really just, they're going to go ahead and move on and, Keep Impact Wrestling on the same course. I think what will help as well with this company is the fact you're in Toronto. And they're going to go back up to Canada and Mexico again and start doing that run where maybe some other stars from other companies will be able to go ahead and do some appearances on their brand. That will be helpful. But right now, this is what Impact Wrestling does. They get some really hot moments and they got some really great stars going on. And then they just kind of they go a little bit off a different end. Like, I remember last year when Josh Alexander had gotten the belt, Jordy Grace had gotten the women's knockouts title, and Speedball by and Mike Bailey was ex-division champion. Pretty hot time. And Honor No More coming in, pretty com- pretty hot coming off of that last year. Now things have kind of cooled off. They need to build something else to kind of build right up. The design's not it. The Bully Ray, Tommy Dreamer stuff, we've seen this kind of stuff over and over. Like, the one thing that really got me off, and this is not, I guess, Bully Ray, it's just I'm like, Impact, I like to see the younger stars shine. That's what I want. And so, like, the ones that are the, the mainstays, the originals in that brand, like, when I saw Moose's champion, I was happy about that. When I saw Josh's champion, I was happy about that. Jordan or Deanna Ferrasso loved them as champions, right? It's like, the, it's the grassroots, the inside of the Impact Wrestling that really does well. Speedball Mike Bailey, they brought him into the mix. He's been great. I want to see him out there. 
as an X Division champion. Now, Trey Miller out there, he's champion, but Trey right now has kind of lost steam to me ever since his whole thing with Sammy Callahan. And Callahan has just like been, where do you need to put me, coach? Like he's just been assigned something, he works on it. And Boos is the same way. And I think those guys need to be put back up into something a little more prominent. When it comes to Macklin, I get a feeling like I get a feeling like all this is going to take the belt off of Macklin. Maybe not by the time we get to Slammiversary, which is I think that's where they're going to go with the next. By that point, Slammiversary, Macklin and all this should be a world title match. I have to wait and see what they're going to do. And I'll wait for that and I'll see how the call turns out. So that's all set, which is fine. One other thing I got to bring up before we wrap things up. WWE with a very smart thing they did. Getting their relationship with Twitch back up. Now, it's been a while, but it was smart for them to go ahead and get back on here. It's interesting. Are you telling me that Vince is not involved now because of the fact that Twitch is was something that was being used as a property, but then when they changed things up and... WWE, WWE, WWE wanted to be able to benefit from that. They said, no, we want, we'll want we take Twitch, but we're going to work with them. So Sean Ross, Sabbath, of Five Select, reports that the deal's been made and the superstars can go back with a few restrictions. There will be a three-way split with Twitch. Talent will only get most of it. And restrictions will be that talent won't be, won't be allowed to stream with people from other companies without getting clearance to do so. And talent was very clear they were happy about the deal. This is Triple H, Nick Khan, and Everybody else getting involved. Look, besides the fact that the independent contracts are set in place, we still don't know what's going to happen when a debtor comes in if they're going to keep the independent contractor deals in play. What I do think is something about if they go ahead and set things up where Twitch is another revenue stream for these people, along with the deals they're getting right now, with all their partners, all their sponsors to do ads for them to which these superstars should be making money off of those as well. That would be cool as well. We'll see where they go, but I like what they're doing so far. That's the show for tonight. Thanks for listening in, catching it as you always do. Let me put it to you like this. We'll come back next week with the Wrestling is Real podcast. Remember where you find the show, wrestlingisreal.com. Find the show on Apple, Amazon, Spotify, and wherever you find podcasts. You can find me at King of Podcasts on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok, among other places. And until next week, come back for another Wrestling Israel podcast because wrestling needs us.